Uh, thanks very much. Uh, that's a really nice introduction. Um, so yeah, as um, Dylan mentioned, I'm Phoebe. Um, I've recently graduated from the University of York and I graduated from the University of Liverpool doing my undergraduate degree a couple of years ago. Um, so it's really special to be invited back kind of virtually to Liverpool and I'm really honoured to be here today. Um, it's such a wonderful webinar series. I've been looking up to it for a few years now. So yeah, it's really big to be part of it. Um, so thank you. Um, so Clothing the Caveman, Recent Insights in Middle Paleolithic Clothing um, is kind of the culmination of the last two years of research. Um, so both my undergraduate dissertation and my postgraduate dissertation focused on different aspects of clothing. Um, so I'm kind of going to take you through kind of clothing in its broad sense as applied to Neanderthals. Um, so if I can get my slide to move. Um, uh, this is a bit of a brief overview of the kind of the topics I'd like to cover. Um, so I'd like to start looking at um, why looking at clothing is important, um, particularly in relation to our kind of perception of Neanderthals as contemporary people. Um, I'd then like to talk about the kind of the theoretical origins of clothing um, and what we have seen in the Upper Paleolithic, um, which should then um, lead us nicely into thinking about Middle Paleolithic environments and clothing as an adaptive strategy to coping with some of these environments. Um, I then want to move on to talking about the kind of the general trends in clothing research, and I'll introduce a kind of, I think it's 13 main papers that are, have been involved in clothing research in the last few years. Um, and then I want to spend a, a fair chunk of time talking about the archaeological evidence for clothing before moving on to a brief kind of overview of my particular focus, which has been on footwear and thinking about alternative technologies for clothing. Um, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of concluding thoughts. So why should we look at clothing? Um, for me, on a personal level, I have loved clothing since I was a kid. Um, I've also loved thinking about human evolution. Um, I've been interested in it again since I was a kid. So it's kind of a no brainer putting the two together. But aside from my personal love of clothing, um, I think that clothing can bring a really valuable um, a variety of things to the table when thinking about Neanderthals. Um, clothing is kind of the first, it is a big um, impression of how you think about people and you can come to a lot of conclusions about someone about their clothing. Um, so as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, Neanderthals have gone through a fair few renditions. Um, we kind of start by seeing Neanderthals as kind of um, ape-like creatures, very bestial, or kind of like, as we see on this other side, um, kind of ogre-like um, and very separate from um, ourselves. They are not human, they are other things, they're animal or like um, kind of almost mythical. Um, but if we start to think about clothing in a more, um, in in a more kind of positive light, we then begin to come to these really beautiful images. Um, and as you can see, this lady in um, this Tom Bjorklund image from 2018 is wearing clothing. And she just looks so much more human. She looks like a woman, she looks like a person, as opposed to these images of kind of beasts and ogres. Um, and I think that by looking at clothing, of course, you have to look at, at it in a scientific way. It can really change our perception of Neanderthals. And um, it kind of the change that we're seeing is fitting in with these general trends of seeing Neanderthals as more complexly cognitive people. But this brings me nicely on to um, thinking about the evidence for clothing from the Upper Paleolithic. Um, so this kind of has been more traditionally seen as the area when clothing has appeared. Um, we see these fantastic bead assemblages um, from a variety of sites. Um, and we also see even textile imprints, um, as we see here from ceramics found at Pavlov. And I think we see similar ones at Domi Vastanice, which are very famous Upper Paleolithic sites. And during the Upper Paleolithic, we also start to see the adoption of needles, um, as we see here from this example of Creswell Crags. Um, our oldest example of a needle comes from Denisova Cave in Russia, but we also have examples in Sabudu Cave and other caves um, from the African continent. Um, and I think the needle has kind of been seen as a bit of a smoking gun. If you have a needle, you probably have clothing because there are not many things you can do with a needle other than making clothes. 
Um, and so because it's so it's more obvious in the upper Paleolithic than the middle Paleolithic, um, we kind of have related clothing more specifically with modern humans than Neanderthals. Um, but can we see the origins of clothing without the organic materials? Um, as we have seen here, we do have we don't have any organic materials associated with the upper Paleolithic. Um, but we also don't with the middle Paleolithic. So this brings the question of how should we um, identify the origin of clothing? Um, so Ian Gilligan in his 2010 paper identifies three different models for the origins of clothing. These are psychological, social, and physical. And um, psychological and social are very interconnected. Um, so these are things like the desire for decoration or modesty or disguise or things like status or luxury symbols. Um, but he has a really interesting discussion about how these are potentially kind of um, secondary aspects of clothing, and they also can be fulfilled by things other than clothing. So for example, um, decoration and modesty and disguise can all be fulfilled by things like painting the body or scarification um, or other like tattooing and things. So I think that I agree with him in his next conclusion, which is that the physical or thermal model, which indicates that clothing is um, comes out of a desire for protection from the elements, is probably the best model for looking at the origins of clothing. So he says that by looking at the environment, we can see um, people living in areas that would have needed clothing. So this brings me on to the next section of um, my talk, which is thinking about what the Middle Paleolithic environments were actually like. Were they cold enough to require clothing? Um, and how, did ne how were Neanderthals adapted to cope with these environments? Um, so I've got this kind of glaring um, video for you that I've made using the Oscillaires database. Um, this is a database of bioclimatic variables that stretches, I think, all the way back into the Pliocene. Um, and although it has been criticized for um, having some methodological issues with it, this is one of the only databases that is GIS compatible. And I think that it is a, um, for what we have at the moment, it is a fairly decent way of kind of identifying the change in climate um, throughout the Middle Paleolithic. Um, as part of this, I'm kind of uh, counting the Middle Paleolithic um, from 300,000 years ago until Neanderthal's extinction around 40 to 30,000 years ago. Um, so I'm not including the archaic Neanderthals as seen as at sites like Atapueca. Um, and this next slide kind of indicates um, in written detail what was going on in the last slide. Um, so during this period, we have a series of interglacial and glacial periods um, where we see during glacial periods, massive expansion of ice sheets, um, probably expansion of steppe tundra um, and expansion of species such as reindeer, mammoth, steppe bison and a reduction in tree cover. Conversely, we have also a series of interglacials where we would see a reduction in ice sheet cover and um, an expansion of flora and fauna from warm stages. So we um, have a lot of different types of trees, a lot of different types of animals um, as highlighted here. Um, MIS-3 is an interesting interglacial because it doesn't ever really reach the kind of heights that an interglacial should, and it's quite a period of instability. Um, so this is really interesting to look at. What I'm not showing you on this table and what isn't really represented on this table is that there is a degree of um, geographical difference. So I know, um, for example, in Spain, um, some areas are really affected by the changes in MIS 4 and 3, whereas others kind of say the same. And it's the same in Italy. We can see areas that basically don't change. Um, and I think that this is an interesting aspect and our um, knowledge of the environmental baselines is constantly changing. And I think that this is really interesting in applying it to Neanderthals. Um, so the question remains, are Neanderthals living in cold areas when um, it gets cold? And I think the answer is yes. We do see some um, examples of regional extinctions, but we do have examples of Neanderthal sites in very high latitudes when it's cold. And even when it's warm, 
as we are in an interglacial at the moment, it still gets cold. It's still, we still have winter and we still have freak periods of cold. So this brings me on to thinking about how Neanderthals are adapted to the cold. Um, they have been historically proposed as kind of the cold adapted human species. And this is largely from these two um, uh, perceived adaptations. So they have, in comparison to us, quite large barrel chests, short limbs that reduce their surface area. And these are kind of seen in relation to um, Bergman and Allen's rules on a surface area of species at high latitudes. And their very large noses have been perceived as potentially mechanisms for warming up cold air. Um, so yeah, as I've said, they are, have traditionally been seen as very cold adapted. We also have um, a variety of other adaptations, um, including increased body hair, increased subcutaneous fat, enhanced muscle tissue, greater development of brown adipose tissues, increases in basal metabolic rate, or even potentially hibernation. Um, quite a lot of these are theoretical adaptations because we don't have soft tissue from Neanderthals. Um, and I think that there are some flaws with some of these. So for example, the increase in subcutaneous fats and the enhanced muscle tissue that Neanderthals would have needed to have coped with kind of the level of cold that some of them are having to cope with um, has, I think, by one estimate, been calculated to add another 52% body weight, which when you think about it is a massive increase in kind of the food that they would have had to eat to sustain that. And it kind of seems a bit maladaptive and probably not likely. Um, the same goes for things like hibernation. We see, I think whilst it's interesting to keep an open mind to things like this, hibernation um, and sleep more generally is a period of significant heat loss. And so I'm not sure about its kind of um, applicability to conserving warmth. Um, and so this then brings me on to introducing the main papers that are actually involved in talking about Neanderthal clothing. Um, and with this very bright coloring, I am indicating how many papers use physiological modeling to examine the question of whether Neanderthals needed clothing. So all of these papers use the idea of Neanderthals being biologically adapted to the cold and test how far this is. So this top paper, Ayala and Wheeler, um, was also the first paper that kind of came out and said that Neanderthals probably weren't cold adapted enough to have survived without additional cultural um, help. Um, and it was kind of a groundbreaking paper. And from then we've seen this kind of burst of interest in Neanderthal clothing. And we've seen a lot of different physiological modeling and most, in fact, all of these papers agree that some degree of cultural um, help was needed to survive the cold. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting aspect. And three things have traditionally been um, traditionally been put forward as um, potential cultural adaptations to the cold. Um, so these are fire, shelter, and clothing. We do have evidence of Neanderthals using fire. We have seen from microware um, that Neanderthals could manufacture fire. We see big changes in landscape devoted um, as a result of use of fire, so at Newmark Nord. Um, and we also see things like birch bark tar, which is a sticky tar substance, which you can only make um, through using fire. We also um, can think about shelter, but it is slightly less cut and dry than fire. We do see um, signs of Neanderthals using things like rock shelters as kind of home bases. Um, so for example, at Abrik Romani, but um, shelter is a little bit more ephemeral to see in the archaeological record and things that might have been used as shelter probably have disappeared um, and we just don't have access to this kind of thing anymore, which is kind of sad, but I think that shelter is probably likely in my head. Um, but fire and shelter have a significant disadvantage that cloth clothing doesn't have. Fire and shelter can only keep you warm when you are near it or doing something related to it. So whilst fire, um, kind of when you first think of it, it's obviously a heat source. It can keep you warm when you're um, collecting fuel for your fire or when you are eating food from your fire. Um, but if you're not doing activities related to the fire, you're not gonna be warm. Same with shelter. If you're not in your shelter, you're not gonna be warm. 
Whereas clothing allows you to have a portable warm environment. And I think that because of this, clothing is one of the most important adaptive strategies um, and has been kind of accepted by the literature as one of the most likely things that Neanderthals were doing to um, stay warm in these cold environments. And from this kind of acceptance, we've started to see these beautiful images come forward of where Neanderthals might have needed clothing. Um, so this is from a great paper by Nathan Wales from 2012. Um, I really recommend reading it if you're interested. Um, and as you can see, these triangles are um, archaeological sites associated with Neanderthals. And a lot of them are in areas that would have required up to 90% of the body to be covered in clothing. Um, so I think it's a really it's nice that we're at this point where we can kind of accept that Neanderthals were needing clothing. And so the from this acceptance, the conversation has now turned to what this clothing might have looked like. Um, and we see the argument has turned to, is this clothing simple or is this clothing complex? Um, simple clothing is defined as being um, cape-like and not requiring tailoring. Complex clothing is requiring tailoring and it, the clues in the name, it's quite complex. Um, and so this is quite an interesting argument. And I think it really feeds into this question of are Neanderthals cognitively complex or are they cognitively not? Are they cognitively simple? Um, and whilst most of these papers um, or more of these papers are saying that Neanderthals are wearing simple clothing, these have kind of approached it in the um, way of thinking, what is the minimal amount of clothing that a Neanderthal could have got away with? And this is how the, a, a few of these papers have come to this conclusion of them only wearing simple clothing. But I think that it is worth considering um, complex clothing as a um, interesting argument. So I know that Whale, um, not Wales, White in particular, um, says that only with complex clothing can you achieve the portable insulative environment that you would have needed for clothing to be warm. Um, so I think that this is a really interesting point where we're at at the moment with the simple and, and complex clothing. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about as I've been doing my research. Um, and I will link back to it um, in a few slides time. So this brings me on to the main bulk of my talk, which is talking about the archaeological evidence for Neanderthal clothing. And I have kind of been surprised at how much archaeological evidence for Neanderthal clothing there is. Um, as I had pointed out earlier, a lot of the papers that have been discussing Neanderthal clothing focus more on the kind of physiological modelling um, and the likelihood that Neanderthals would have needed clothing based on these biological adaptations. But we do have um, a few papers that have considered it more in the light of what the archaeological evidence that we have suggests. Um, so in particular, this one that's highlighted in red by Mark Collard um, from, at, et al. from 2016, which is a really interesting paper. And they have um, taken the faunal assemblages from MIS-3, I believe, um, and compared the Neanderthal assemblages to similar assemblages from modern humans, and then also compared that to contemporary ethnographic populations to look at whether Neanderthals are regularly using animals associated with making cold weather clothing. And they do find that Neanderthals are. They're using animals like reindeer fairly regularly. In fact, I think it's one of the main animals that, they, that they're using in the assemblages that they look at, um, which indicates that Neanderthals are using animals related to clothing. But they do come to this interesting conclusion that um, Neanderthals don't seem to be using animals that are associated with um, making fur trims. So animals like wolverine have very thick hair that's very commonly used in making fur trims, which can be used on like your cuffs or around your face to seal in um, warm air inside and keep cold air out. And this is how they've kind of got to this conclusion that Neanderthals, or that this more aligns with this idea of simple clothing. Um, and I think that this is a really interesting approach. And I wanted to look at kind of the other aspects of the archeological re record that are associated with clothing. Um, and so this image is kind of all the sites that I have found that have evidence for clothing. Um, so the main thing that I'm looking for is tools or um, 
yeah, tools that are associated with hide processing. Um, hide processing doesn't have a one-to-one -one relationship with clothing, where if you're making a hide, doesn't mean that you're making clothing. You can use hides, um, which help process animal skins. You can use them in making um, storage units, so like bags and things like this, or making shelter. But I think with the limited or relatively limited evidence that we had, again, we have no organic material, we have no direct evidence of clothing we've got unless clothing comes out of a glacier we are not going to have any evidence anytime soon of a neanderthal shirt or trousers or whatever um so i think that hide processing and the tools related to it is the most useful thing that we can look for in relation to clothing at the moment uh so i'm going to break this down in the next couple of slides um and show you what kind of things i have found so the first aspect of hide processing is skinning i found these images from WikiHow, which made me laugh. Um, so put them on for you. Um, and this table is not exhaustive, I don't think, um, but it's a few key examples of skinning that we can see from the archaeological record. Um, this example at the top here from Scherningen um, is a very recent paper. I think it came out the very end of 2022. Um, and it showed very delicate cut marks on bare bones that indicate that the humans processing these bones were trying to release the skin with as little damage as possible. And this potentially indicates that Neanderthals were wanting to use the bare skin um, for things like clothing. As you, can, as you may imagine, it, it has good insulative properties for surviving the cold and Scherningen in, being in Germany is quite a high latitude site. Um, so these things like skinning are pretty interesting. We also, at some of these sites that have um, skinning or some of the examples of skinning, we see things like tendon removal. And tendons can be used, um, which I'll come back to in a couple of slides time, um, as things like cords um, or things that can be used in clothing construction, which I think is really interesting that we actually can see this. And um, the kind of the things, the methods that we're using are things like microscopes and microscopy and things like that. The main bulk of our evidence to do with hide processing comes from stone tools. Um, and this is kind of moving from skinning an animal to making it into a workable, usable thing for clothing. And there's actually at least 55 sites associated with um, stone tools with evidence of hide processing, including cutting, scraping, and piercing. Um, a lot of these examples have been pulled together already by Emily Claude et al. in 2019. I've kind of added a few in my own research. I've now got some massive Excel spreadsheets of all my um, all these tools. Um, but I thought it was really interesting how many sites actually are associated or have evidence associated with hide processing. Um, again, our oldest example of cutting and scraping fresh and dry hides dates to 300,000 years ago at Scherningen in Germany. Um, and we do see some sites that have complete hide processing sequences, um, such as Le Combet, which is in France. And um, at these sites, you can see it going from flesh to dry, usable hides. But interestingly, we actually also have some sites that only show evidence of dry hide processing. Um, so you can tell the difference um, in it, the microware. So um, processing a fresh hide and processing a dry hide um, produce different marks on the stone tools. Although we do have examples stretching back to 300,000 years ago, um, as I've highlighted, Interestingly, most of our examples do cluster within the last glacial cycle, and these are associated with Chateauperonian or Eleusian industries. So these are transitional industries going from the Mysterian um, into the kind of the end of Neanderthals. And I don't really know why it's like this, um, but I thought that that was an interesting point to bring up. Um, so it is an extended tradition, but we see a big cluster of it from kind of MIS four and three. The next type of uh, tool that are associated with hide processing are bone tools. And I was kind of blown away by how many bone tools that we have um, associated with hide processing. I kind of knew about a few examples, but it wasn't until I kind of dove into this thing that I realized how many examples we actually have. Um, and we have a number of different types of bone tools, including awls, lissoirs, which are used for um, scraping and burnishing hides, and awls, which are used for, um, let's say awls already, um, 
yeah, also used for um, piercing hides. And then we also have actually one possible needle fragment um, at this site from Italy, uh, which I thought was really interesting. I um, I'm not sure whether it is a needle fragment or not, but I think it's interesting to be brought up. And we can see that um, HP means hide processing and P means piercing, S means scraping. Um, the Neanderthals are doing quite a few different things with their bone tools. It's also interesting comparing some of these tools, and we can see some clear stylistic parallels between the Lissoirs found in Western Europe, um, so in France, and the Lissoirs found in Russia at Chagaskaya here. Um, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily because uh, the two groups of Neanderthals were communicating, but I think that it indicates that um, this kind of hide processing is embedded in the Neanderthal cultural and cognitive um, toolkit, um, which I thought was really interesting. But again, almost all of our bone tools are associated with Chateau Peronian or Elusian industries. There's one example that I haven't included in this table because it is, it is quite tenuous, but again from Scherningen, um, there is a bone that's possibly also used in burnishing hides, um, although I think more research is needed to say whether it conclusively is or isn't. Um, but I was really, yeah, as I've said, kind of blown away by how many bone tools that are associated with hide processing. Um, and I think particularly things like awls, um, although some awls are used in processing wood, um, their use in clothing is really um, fascinating because they are used for piercing and then potentially um, threading things through through the holes that you've made, um, which I thought was, yeah, really interesting. My last point related to hide processing is the possibility of tanning. So I've kind of spoken um, about um, scraping hides, and I think that technically this does fall underneath the umbrella term of tanning. Um, but I want to talk more specifically about tanning using kind of chemical agents. Um, and this lovely image, um, is a stone scraper that has been found that has potential residue from oak bark tanning. So I think um, residue analysis indicates that there's oak tannins on this um, bark, on this stone scraper. Um, and I think it's really interesting thinking about Neanderthals adding chemical agents to um, skins to change their properties, make them more desirable and so forth. There is a slight debate about other tools that have plant matter on them. Um, it's unclear whether the um, plant matter is only there because the tool's been used both for processing plants and then for processing skins, and they're not actually related. But I think it's interesting to have an open mind for these kind of things. And then this use of ochre is seen on both sewn tools and on um, bone awls. And I think that ochre in particular is a very interesting thing to think about when um, thinking about clothing, because although ochre does have some kind of properties like it's a microbial agent and you can use it in tanning because of this. Um, it has huge visual properties, which I think thinking about Neanderthals using things like ochre on their on their hides and on potentially on their clothing opens up this um, question of were Neanderthals actually really colorful? Um, did these things have meaning for these people? And kind of feeds into these arguments about whether Neanderthals um, were using symbolism and things like this. Um, so although I think the evidence for tanning is not yet super conclusive, and I think it's very sporadic and spaced out, I think that it is really interesting to think about how these things might have been used. Um, and it's really kind of open, yeah, opening boxes in my head for thinking about what this clothing might have looked like. Um, this is the last slide I think I have on, um, the last written slide on archaeological evidence. Um, which is talking about cordage. So I mentioned this a few slides ago with the tendon removal. Um, but in 2022, Hardy et al. published a paper identifying potential um, three ply Z twisted with S twisted cords. So the, the Z and S is how the um, two cords are twisted together um, at a French site, Abri de Maras. And I'm not sure how persuaded I am by this particular example. As you can see, it's really small. Um, and whilst it, but whilst it is fragmentary, I do think that cordage technology does seem to fit quite well with the Neanderthal cognitive and ecological niche as we're beginning to understand it. I think that they had the cognitive abilities to being to start using cords, and I think that um, 
they would have yeah they would have had access to the materials to make cords um and like hide processing use of cordage doesn't have a one-to-one -one relationship with clothing um you can use cords for making bags and for making um helping in making structures but it would have been a key thing in constructing clothing as well um so this is why i think it's useful to look at cordage and I think that even if they weren't making cords like this, they would have had access to other materials which could have performed the same roles um, as cordage, such as sinew um, or tendons, or even large animal hairs like mammoth hairs, which would have been really long and probably quite strong. Um, so yeah, really interesting things to think about in, in my mind anyway. Um, so the next thing that I have done with um, these archeological pieces of evidence is I have interspaced them onto my GIS maps with um, temperatures. Uh, unfortunately, I've kind of, I've lost access to most of my images, which I will be able to get back in the future, but I don't have right now, unfortunately. Um, so I've only got my slides from 40 to 60,000 years ago. So this is 50 and this is 60. And we can see that these sites are actually quite varied in their geographical and, um, temperatures that they're there existing in. Um, I'll just show you them again whilst um, we're here. Um, and yeah, they're really quite spread out. And looking at these kind of temperatures associated with the sites with evidence of um, using clothing, uh, using tools that might have been used in clothing, indicates that there's actually relatively little correlation between sites being colder and exhibiting evidence for clothing manufacture or hide processing, which, yeah, more hide processing than clothing manufacture itself. Um, and there's a real variability here. Um, when comparing the minimum coldest temperatures, which I haven't shown you here, um, but as part of my research, I have also looked at minimum coldest temperatures. We do have Neanderthals making um, or manufacturing materials associated with clothing at very low temperatures. So, um, my, at least minus 16.7, um, which is, I think is on one of these slides. Yeah, it's here, up here. Um, we do have, yeah, as I've mentioned, huge flexibility in temperature. So even with the mean average temperature, rather than the maximum average temperature, we see a difference of 15 degrees between highest and lowest values. So I thought this was a really interesting aspect, um, which brings me to thinking about how we can start to move away from this kind of only simple or only complex narrative. Um, so I think the argument of simple versus complex kind of shades away some of the nuance that can be associated now with Neanderthal clothing. And I think that the number of tools and variety of processes related to hide processing imply that these activities were a relatively common aspect of Neanderthal culture and technology. Um, particularly, as I've mentioned, like the Lissoirs have the very similar um, styles, even though they're so far apart geographically. And I think that the variety of climatic environments that these technologies are found in implies variation in clothing's form and function. I think that different groups of Neanderthals probably looked different from other groups and their clothing fulfilled different functions and looked different uh, from group to group. And so I think that clothing likely existed on a spectrum ranging from simple to complex. Um, there probably were Neanderthals that were wearing very, very simple, just cape-like clothing because that's all they needed and all they wanted. But I think that it's worth considering that some Neanderthals probably are using complex clothes, especially with the use of things like awls um, and possibly cord. Um, and then my last point related to this is that I do think the burst of activity related to hide processing during the Chateau Peronian and Eleusian industries is interesting. And Ian Gilligan suggests that this is potentially um, evidence to suggest that Neanderthal clothing becomes complex during this period as a relation to the climatic environment becoming so variable. Although I'm not sure how much I um, um agree with this in that Neanderthals have gone through um, long periods of very um, fluctuating temperatures, um, but I do think it's really interesting. Um, but aside from the hide processing being so related to Chateauperonian and Lusian industries, I think that it does have a history that extends before this and it's worth remembering that. Um, so it didn't, it didn't come from nowhere. <laughs> 
So to move on to the final portion of my talk, um, kind of talking a bit about my own research. Um, but if you'd like to hear more in depth about this, I, uh, particularly about the footwear, I am going to be presenting at a few conferences coming up that I'll be posting on my Twitter if you'd, if you'd like to hear about them. Um, but footwear fulfills key functional requirements for many extant communities around the globe. And these functional requirements do differ um, from other uh, aspects of clothing. I think with the movement away from thinking mostly about these fundamental questions, did Neanderthals wear clothes? Were they simple? Were they complex? Um, we can begin to explore more nuanced questions, such as this possibility of Neanderthals using footwear. A little bit has been done on footwear already. Um, Trinkhaus and Trinkhaus and Shang um, use um, examples of Neanderthal pedo, pedal robustness, so their um, foot bones. And um, they examine these and compare them to modern human populations to imply that um, Neanderthals, their foot bones are so robust that it can only be because they have no support from footwear. Um, so this implies no use of rigid footwear. But I do think our recent improvements in our knowledge of Neanderthal and modern human foot formation and its interaction with the ground. So for example, I know there's one paper that said that it's more about um, diets and um, what the ground is like than actually how you'll, um, than, than what footwear does to your foot. Um, and I think that because of these improvements, we can start questioning this model of their foot bones are more robust, therefore they're not wearing shoes. Um, and I think that very similar lines of inquiry to those apply, that I've applied to the general question of clothing and other people have applied can also be applied to the question of footwear. Um, and whilst my master's dissertation was mostly looking at footwear in a kind of modeling it, comparing it to the environment, I have been given some wonderful funding from Exarch to put this into an experimental um, context which I have been doing I, this last month, I think, um, where I tested a variety of different types of footwear. Um, we have, this is half a reindeer skin wrapped around my foot. Um, this is like a drawstring bag wrapped around my foot. It's literally a circle with a big drawstring. Um, this is a kind of the sole of my foot shaped thing wrapped around my foot with board. This is... Um, a big strip like about this wide that's wrapped around my foot. And then this is a two part uh, tailored footwear um, using that I made using no needles. I used only an awl and pushed cord through it. Um, and I've had access to a thermal camera and it's been a really interesting experiment that's kind of, um, again, I'm thinking about these questions of simple versus complex. These are very simple footwears when you think about it. This is literally just a straight strip that you've wrapped around your foot but they failed almost immediately. Whereas other aspects of simple clothing, this is literally just half a reindeer skin, as I said, this worked really well um, and kept me really warm. Um, so I think that it's not, um, th that thinking about these clothing can have real nuance to, to the questions that we can answer. Um, and it's really interesting because these two footwears also kept my foot very warm. Um, but this one in particular required a lot less fabric usage. This was um, possibly even a quarter of the amount of fabric that I needed to use here. Um, and so looking at footwear in its functional aspects can then feed into these wider questions of clothing as a whole. And again, yeah, if you'd like to hear me talk more about this, I will be in upcoming weeks. And then my final um, thing that I'd like to just touch on was the focus of my undergraduate research. Um, and it's thinking about potential alternative methods of making clothing that might not be immediately visible in the archeological record. Um, so this uh, study looked most particularly about whether birch bark glue could have been used as a kind of fabric glue. And whilst the results were not perhaps conclusive or weren't necessarily in favor of the birch bark tar, um, this compares birch bark tar down here, um, the, the strength. So I attached two pieces of leather together and pulled them apart and measured the force needed to pull them apart. Um, and this group here 
is the um, sewn um, seam measurements that I've taken from this paper by Ewing and Darwin. Um, I think that it's useful to keep an open mind about this kind of thing. And this, these were stronger than I expected them to be. Um, and this it is from a person that had never made birch bark tar before. And so for people that had the technological prowess and know-how of these kind of materials, I think that it's worth considering the alternative methods that we don't necessarily think of as related to clothing might have been applied to clothing in a period of time that is so far removed from our own with indeed a species that isn't our own species. Um, so yeah, these are the kind of final thoughts I'd like to leave you on. Um, that Neanderthal clothing is a really important aspect of how we understand Neanderthals. And I think it does really feed into these um, changing views of Neanderthals. And I think it can help us move forwards into thinking of Neanderthals as complex people. Um, I think that environmental and physiological modeling demonstrates that Neanderthals required additional cultural protection from extreme temperatures. I think this is really well accepted in the literature now. Um, and implies that they needed clothing. Um, and this brings me on to my next point, which indicates that the archeological evidence, whilst it is definitely limited, um, it's surprisingly varied. And I think that this indicates that clothing usage was quite widely adopted um, and probably varied in its form and its function, as I've said earlier. I think the variety of archeological evidence can and should potentially also prompt a movement away from framing the Neanderthal clothing question only in the light of simple versus complex clothing. Um, and it's really nice, I think, that we can start to think of these in more nuance as we do more um, research, which is my final point. The progress in clothing research is beginning to allow us to investigate more specialized elements of clothing with increasing nuance as well, um, such as things like footwear. Um, so that's kind of conclude the conclusion of my talk. Um, I love Neanderthal clothing. I think it's really interesting. I think it's um, an opportunity for a bit of imagination, um, but it's also very scientifically driven. And I, yeah, I've really enjoyed studying it. Um, so I have a few acknowledgements. Um, thank you very much to Exarc for their generous funding in my um, research in footwear and thank you to everyone that has been involved at both York and um, Liverpool in supporting both my undergraduate dissertation research and my master's research um, and these are a few references or a lot of references um, and then that is everything uh, and then should I stop sharing yeah you can go stop sharing the screen Thank you very much, Stevie. That was a really interesting talk, not just your synthesis of the archaeology, but also uh, your own work. Um, and I also agree that we should be a little bit sceptical of that um, hardy paper. There's a lot of unanswered <laughs> questions there. Um, so now it's time for our Q&A, and I see we already actually have a question in the chat. Um, so Walter has asked, has there been a transfer of clothing technology from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens in any geographic area? I think that's a good question and I would like to know the answer. Um, I think it's because there's so little evidence for Neanderthal clothing technology, um, it's difficult to say whether it was, um, whether Neanderthals gave anything to modern humans. And I think there's this big question about whether modern humans are coming in and giving um, Neanderthals um, uh, technological know-how and these kind of things. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if this can be solved by the archaeological record in kind of coming years. Um, sorry, I can't give you a more conclusive answer, as I'm not sure, really. Yeah, hopefully that will reveal itself eventually. Mm -hmm. um, Isabel has another question in the chat. Uh, how likely is it that plant-based fabric evidence could survive in the archaeological record? Um, I think that's a good question as well. Um, I think that plant-based fabric evidence would be most likely to reveal itself in kind of um, like in the same way as Ertzi the Iceman, like from glacial deposits. Um, and at the moment, as I've said, we don't really have any. I think the evidence that we've got from upper Paleolithic contexts, such as Donny Vestaniche and Pavlov with the imprints of plant-based textiles, is the kind of most likely way that we would be able to see it in a Neanderthal context. Um, and 
indeed we do have things like there's an example of a piece of birch bark tar that has a thumbprint in it and you could possibly have a very similar thing with um fabric imprints coming up on something like this so kind of you get the ephemeral evidence of it and i think that that's more likely than actually having the fabric itself um although as I, there are people looking for it, as you've seen with the Hardy paper. Um, so we will see if any comes up in the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, Harry, I see you have a question, waiting patiently and not being able to abuse your host privileges like you usually do. It's very rude of you to say, but uh, yeah, amazing. Very interesting. Uh, this is sort of, I don't really spend a lot of time with this stuff. So this could be a completely naive question, but I'm I'm one of those really annoying uh, people that sometimes wears a poncho, and <laughs> when I when I, I I'm always surprised at how warm I am yeah. inside of you know this very thin, loose layer of clothing. Do you know of or have you done any like experimental work on the actual temperature differences between wearing something loose and thin, but surprisingly warm like a poncho? versus the what we would perceive as the more complex like sewn uh seamed clothing do you know of any experiments or have you done any yourself that have actually tested the difference um i know of i think there was in robert hosfield's book on the earliest europeans from 2020 um he cites an undergraduate thesis i think her name is jessica Piers who looked at um, making some Neanderthal clothing. Um, you kind of can see the conclusions of that in Hosfield's book. Um, but I don't know of anything more specific, but I think there's, there's got to be something out there, especially in the, 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 the textile industry is such a big industry. Um, and I think that you're probably right in that there are a lot of different, um, not just in kind of loose and tight, there's a lot of different um, things you can get from different fabrics. So I know that like linens and things can be really warm, even though that they're so thin. Um, and I think that that is a really good aspect to consider um, when looking at Neanderthal clothing. And I think like, as you said, ponchos are very simple, but the simple doesn't mean bad. And I think that often the simple gets conflated with being simple in your mind or like, like simply, com sim simply, Cognitively simple is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I, I don't think that having simple clothing means that you're having bad clothing or that you are cognitively simple. Um, I, I think that was a bit roundabout and I'm not quite sure if I've completely answered your question, but. No, I think you have, yeah. Thank you very much, very good. Thank you, Harry. We have a few more questions in the chat. So Chris Stringer says, very nice talk, a couple of points. Uh, Lucian might be Homo sapiens associated, um, and also over in northeast China, the Harbin human was seemingly living in an area with today average winter temperatures of minus 15 degrees Celsius over 145,000 years ago. Thanks, Chris. I think that that is, they are some really good points. I think that, um, yeah, the Lucian and Chateau Peronian questions uh, it is really interesting and it is difficult to say sometimes whether it is Homo sapiens or whether it is Neanderthals. Um, and I think that it is really good to be aware of that, especially when you're finding things that are potentially needle points, uh, which could really change how you kind of think about Neanderthals and how they make their clothing. Um, and I think that in relation to your second point, um, there are a few people that are, I know that um, Hosfield and um, uh, there's a paper by Rodriguez and one of the papers by McDonald are really looking for clothing usage in the lower Paleolithic now. And I think that I kind of agree in that I don't think that clothing usage was necessarily even started with Neanderthals, really. Um, so I think it's a really good, it's a good point to bring up. Um, and I would, I don't know much about the Harbin human other than I know that they existed. Um, it'd be interesting to think about the biological adaptations that they might have had that Neanderthals might not have. Mm, that's great. Thank you very much for your questions, Chris. Uh, Matt Grove has a question. Uh, are there any correlations at Neanderthal sites between lines of evidence for shelter, fire and clothing? 
for example, is evidence of hide processing more frequent in open air sites as opposed to caves or rock shelters? Or is there any association between fire use and hide processing at individual sites? That's a good question. And that is a, one of the ways that I um, would like to analyze my data in the future. Um, I think that there are a lot of sites that are displaying lots of different traits of things. I know like at Sherningen, for example, you have lots of different um, examples of Neanderthal behaviors. And there are, um, I think that some of the high processing examples come from Abrit Romani, which is a um, rock shelter that has lots of evidence of Neanderthals being there frequently. Um, so I, I think that um, Neanderthals are not making clothing in isolation and are often using these behaviors with fire and clothing at the same time. Um, I, I think that that's probably wise if you're trying to stay warm. Um, but yeah, sorry, I can't answer that more in depth. I would like to like to be able to. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question actually. Um, with your uh, the the shoes that you are making, have you or are you planning to do like durability tests of them? So say using them to trample over the scatter of lithics, or just walking in the woodland areas with them to see how effective they are. Yeah. So um, what I've done at the moment um, is I've. The experiments have taken place in York's Year Centre, um, which is, I think it stands for York Experimental Archaeology Research Centre. And it is basically an area of woodland um, that does have some lithics on the floor. Um, and keeping the reindeer skin on, uh, reindeer hair on the reindeer skin made such a difference to, um, although you can feel the floor, you can't feel it that much. And um, it actually really helped. I did a kind of a test one that was using a vegetable tanned um, piece of leather and it got so wet um, so quickly. And these reindeer ones just didn't like it was you couldn't see any moisture inside. Um, so I think that uh, although I, I think I, I only wore them for about half an hour to an hour each um, already, you could see quite um, strongly how the way that you process the skins makes a difference for um how durable they are um but i think obviously the the end goal would would be to wear them until they fell apart really um or the wear the ones that didn't fall apart until they do fall apart yeah thank you very much that actually leads me to a second sort of question that i had regarding the furs what, do you think they always would have kept them on because obviously it would get you know, clogged up with a lot of dirt and would even smell, which isn't, you know, the best thing if you're living in an environment that has any sort of carnivores or anything in it. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so with keeping the furs on the reindeer skins, I was kind of thinking a lot about the shoes that are used by the Sami people in uh, Sweden. And um, they keep the reindeer fur on because it increases traction in the snow. Um, and as you can, there's not so much dirt with the snow as there is in other areas. And I think that um, like in environments where you have more snow than dirt, you probably do want to keep the, the fur on. But in these other environments, yeah, it might be it might be nicer and prevent things like mold and rot and smell if you do remove the um, fur. And I think that with the changes or the complexity in hide processing that we can see, um, I think that probably you do have some groups that are using it with fur and some that aren't. And even within the same group, you probably have a, ver a variety, depending on what you want. That's great. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I see there's another question in the chat. Um, so John Gowlett says, very interesting talk. Another example of cold hominins uh, at Arago butchering reindeer, about 600,000. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, I think um, butchering reindeer uh, has taken on a whole new thing for me, kind of thinking about how much reindeer is used in cold weather climate clothing. Um, so that's a nice point to bring up. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, I think before I saw um, someone put their hand up, um, but it's not raised anymore. Would you like to still ask your question? Sorry, I didn't catch uh, the name of who it was who put it up. Yeah, that was me. Um, I was actually just going to ask if leaving the uh, hair on the hide would help with traction, but you answered that. So 
Okay, excellent. Um, does anybody else uh, have any questions? No, it doesn't look like it. Um, in which case, I think that brings uh, today's seminar to an end. So uh, once again, thank you very much, Phoebe, for uh, agreeing to give a talk today. Um, we've really appreciated it. I hope everybody else has enjoyed the talk as much as we have. Um, and I'm sure everybody here will join me in wishing you luck with your PhD application. <laughs> I uh, hope that all goes well. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, and please join us next week, where we have Matea Hardniak, who will be talking about ancient DNA in Neanderthals. So, um, yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, but for now, uh, thank you, Phoebe, and thank you very much for everyone else for coming. <laughs>